Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming um, and, and joining us at, uh, with the Association of African American Museums as we speak about rethinking media. Today is super important to me because our dear friends at Manatnock Media uh, came to me with this idea of just being able to say, hey, Manette, we have an idea that we want to speak to your members. And I kind of also, you know, I twisted their arm virtually and said, come on, let, let's have a conversation with members about what you do and the important work that you do in media. So today um, I am your host, uh, Joy Bailey Bryant from Lord Cultural Resources will be on the call with us as well. Steve Bressler from Manatnock Media, Tiffany English, can you just uh, wave as I call your name? Uh, I also Pamela Jr., who all of you guys know, we just came back from Mississippi. Well, I shouldn't say just came back. It's been since 2019, but our last in-person conference was in Mississippi. So you all know Pam very well. Uh, Claudia Levin from Manatnock Media, and then also Tracy Litwick. Litwin, I'm sorry, Tracy, I'm gonna get it uh, from Manatnock as well. Uh, the one thing that I really want you all to know about Manatnock is they've been designing and producing media experiences for museums since 1980. Um, and I don't wanna call anybody out, but I'm sure that that's uh, longer than some of us have been alive. So, um, or in the museum field. So I'm not like, again, I'm not gonna call anybody out because that's ageism. But thank you so much for being here uh, with us and, and, and really just looking at the email and saying, I want to be part of, of this conversation. Um, I think that you're going to really love what the team has pulled together. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is just have a quick definition of what Manatnock uh, discuss, discusses about the definition of media. For them, it's for the purposes of this discussion, media refers to the use of sound, video, digital, digital technologies, as well as lighting, FX, and museums. Uh, today, Manatnock and the panelists will talk about the need to rethink how we use those technologies create, creatively and how multimedia design can have a significant impact on the visitor experience. Uh, so, I have a quick icebreaker for everyone. And I, I not really, I guess we can start with Steve with the icebreaker and then you guys can just unmute your, uh, your mic um, as panelists uh, when you pass your virtual, mic your virtual microphone. And the, the icebreaker for today is, what are some of the most effective uses of media you've seen in museums? And let's start with Steve. With me? Yeah. But that's an unfair question because, <laughs> but I'll, <laughs> I, <laughs> um, gosh. Okay. I'm, I'm obviously, I, I'm biased because I think um, some of the most powerful experiences are the ones we've designed, which were in the civil rights, in the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, especially. Uh, uh, Goodman, you know, Goodman Cheney or Cheney Goodman Schwerner Theater, um, the separate but not equal, uh, ex separate but equal experience in the school at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museums. Uh, both were kind of environments the themed. One was a representational themed environment of a school split down the middle, poor rural black, poor rural white, and the experiences uh, unfolding there. And then the other one, of course was the murder during Freedom Summer of the three college students. Um, that was in a more abstract environment. Um, so, the, but again, we did that. So it's a biased question uh, or a biased response. I, it's, it's okay, you're, you're amongst friends. So it's okay. okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Joy, uh, same question. What are the most effective uses of media you've seen in museums? You know, I think that one of the things that's been super um, important is when you really feel that connection, um, because people think of media as a tool a lot of times when it has such an opportunity to be the connecting piece. It is the connecting um, kind of moment, right? So when you think about, um, we we worked with Manadnock, uh, but it also happens in other spaces, right? 
Um, with the Albany Civil Rights Institute, there is a space where you put your hands on the, the wall because of the fingerprints that you, you feel that the handprints um, of the people that were um, that were imprisoned and they were um, and, and so you're, you're able to put your hands right there where those hands would have been and you can, and you get the um, there's a media experience that happens there. But it also is because of the touch, the gener you know, the generative oper um, the way that it affects your mind um, and connects and you're making that connection with that person and that touch and it's so powerful, right? So um, that's um, when you um, when you ask me that question, it's the most immediate um, response that I have because anything that just makes you really um, connect in a deep way like that visceral reaction is going to be the thing that's going to capture a visitor, a person at all. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Pam. For me, I think that, of course, I am going to be biased since I'm the director of the two Mississippi museums and the work that Manadnock has done. But for me, media also takes in the size of the space. And we don't really talk about that in the intimacy and how the sounds uh, just kind of permeate throughout your system. And I think that goes along with the emotions that people have when they go into the Cheney Goodman and Schwerner or the Emmett Till or the Mega Evers, where as someone like Merle Evers couldn't even, can't even go through hasn't really sat down in the space to see it because of what it does to her. So those effects are, are, are really something that the emotional effects that it brings about is, is something for me and that I see that happens with the patrons that come to the museums. I'm not going to speak about the, the, uh, the way that everything touched me when I walked through uh, the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, because again, I feel like, um, I feel that Manatnock did a, a fantastic job and uh, w with the media in your museum. And I feel that I'm also going to be a little biased by speaking about it. So I'm going to <laughs> pass it over to uh, Tassany as well. Okay, well, I also will be biased, uh, but I I really loved um, when I had an opportunity to visit the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, and it's also where I met um, with the Manatnock team at the AAAM conference that was being held um, in Jackson. And I really loved the musical piece, um, just because I love music, I love hymns, I love anything that takes uh, me back to like my ancestral roots and things that I heard my grandparents talking about. Um, and as someone who, who's in the museum field, one of the other powerful um, exhibit was the Emmett Till space, right? And um, every time I, I hear the story, but the narration was just so powerful there. And I think that also was because of the connection of voices from Miss Mississippians um, in that, and um, and just just another museum that still touches me um, is the EJI in the Legacy Museum. Um, when you walk in and the interactive of of individuals sharing pieces of them and stories, and so that's also just very powerful as well. Thank you, uh, Claudia. Do you have anything to add? And no, Tracy. Do you have anything to add? For the ice well, breaker? I thought I'd add just one little thing that's not a Manadnock piece, but it's sort of what started me on this path of working on museum media. And this was actually at the PS1 Art Museum in New York City. Um, there was this tiny little thing that you could easily walk right by. It was like a crack, a hole in the floorboard. And in that crack, there was a tiny little monitor and a little person just sort of, you know, trying to get your attention as you walked by. And I just thought, who, what artists thought of that? It was just a great thing to do, you know, to to take advantage of this this space and this you know think this defect in the space and make it into something. I just thought that was really special. Yes, I think we all can um, in in this field anyway, and I think uh, our, our patrons as well 
can really just think about that one time that media spoke to you in a museum, mm-hmm. um, whether it was, you know, you were walking around with a cassette tape deck. <laughs> For those of us who are old enough to know about walking around with cassette tape decks before everything moved over to an iPod and then later um, uh, 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 the, the tele, you know, our iPhones or uh, I'm sorry for the Android users or your Android, so <laughs> cell phone in general. Um, uh, the next thing, uh, Steve, I just want to pass this conversation, this uh, particular question over to you. Why do you think uh, that we need to rethink museum media? Okay, that's a good question and I'll take it. <laughs> uh, um, you know, think about today, we all have our smartphones, we all have our tablets, we have our computers, we have access to any documentary we want to ever see. We can. We used to be able to go see a feature film in the theater and someday maybe that'll come back. But the real challenge is uh, we're so media in, in, its, in various forms has so permeated our culture. It's like, okay, when you come to a museum, we have to, our feeling is, my feeling is we have to give your visitors an experience they can't get anywhere else. And that means moving beyond the conventional uses of media. Yes, and those conventional uses of media in museums are touch screens, touch tables, uh, large projections on screens, um, oh, video walls. I mean, they're all good technologies, but the idea is how do we move beyond the explicit use of those technologies? So fine, you see a big video wall somewhere, impressive, right? or you see a big touch table and you got five people gathered around it or so. Okay, now we, what I'm saying, what I'm suggesting, what we're suggesting at Manamak is how can we move beyond it? That's the challenging question. And the way is, there's several answers to that question. And I'm gonna give you a, a few answers that we've kind of come up with, but there's lots of more um, of answers to be discovered. So let's consider this a beginning of a journey on that discovery. Um, The underlying principle of of moving beyond just the conventional is that the multimedia design, and I have to use my hands here, I'm sorry, multimedia design and exhibit design have to co-evolve. They each inform the other. And I'm gonna share my screen and give you some examples of that right now in a a, a variety of ways. So hold on for just a second. I trust that everybody can see my screen. Yes? Yes. Okay. So here's an, this is at the Harry uh, Truman Presidential Library Museum, which is opening later uh, this spring. And one of our challenges in in working on the development of the content was the world that Truman kind of stepped into uh, towards the end of World War II and after the end of World War II, where Asia and Europe were in ruins and um, the spread of communism was threatening to kind of, well, was threatening. And Truman has to kind of do something to help start to stem that expansion and promote democracy. So what we did is working with a designer, we created this space, a real rubble environment in, in World War II, like you're somewhere in Europe. And we tell the story. The story is only seven and a half, seven minutes long, but in this space using lighting, sound, map, video, we tell the story um, of how Truman comes to grapple with the world, with the post-World War II world. And I'll show you one example of how we use that space. So. Let me flip back for just a second. Keep your eye, you can all see my cursor. So keep your eye on this window frame here as a reference. And then when I go over to here, hold on. Well, what happened? Oh, I see. There, this is the same window frame here. But the idea is we use the entire rubble environment in which to tell the story of this kind of growing cold war between America, between the West and the East, between America and, and or democracy and communism, basically. Um, another example, let me get, I gotta get rid of this little thing here. At the Museum of Science in Boston, what you're seeing here is this image here is rear projected. And this big image here is front projected on a scrim. 
And it's all about the human body and looking inside the human body on a lot of different topics. And so the media form here, and here's another, oh, let me get rid of this thing here. The media form, Um, reflects the, the content, if you get that. So we actually can look inside the human body on three dimensions, almost like it's a three dimensional uh, experience. Um, and this is just an image of the actual theater. Um, at the Southern Poverty Law Center, where we're working with Taffany, there was this challenge. They have this big room with this wonderful mural. But one of the, one of the objectives here was to do a short introductory video program that helps younger people understand what the world in the South was like in the 50s and 60s, growing up in the 50s and 60s. And so we could have easily in this space put a big screen up, you know, electronic screen that comes down from the ceiling and projected that image when, projected that little show when the time came. So, but we looked at this mural more closely and we saw some opportunities. Why don't we see if we can project directly on the mural and use the negative space and modify it a little bit so we can start to play and make the mural come alive with video. And that's what we're working on right now. One of the thing, one of several thing, um, uh, programs or experiences we're working at the, on at uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center. So what you're seeing here is we're projecting, this is a simulation by the way, we're projecting directly onto the mural we're um, using it in a much more visceral way um, than just being, bringing down a big white screen when we wanted to show it off. Um, let's go on here. And this, this is something we've been talking about at the Cheney Goodwin Schwer, uh, at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. We took, whoops, sorry. We took a look at a story, a pretty horrible story, okay? Um, where the police are part uh, uh, complicit in the murder of these three college students in the, in the uh, Freedom Summer of 1964. And so what we decided to do and create a small theater, uh, and it was also created so that if kids, if it was deemed inappropriate for kids, they would, could bypass it. What we did here is projected with one projector on these three surfaces. And you can only get a feel for it here. Those of you who have experienced this know it better in this image. Our hardest thing is trying to capture dimensionality of our experiences with the flat screen. So we're doing our best here. But we really kind of, we, we put a skewed story, a twisted story in a twisted skewed space. And we made use of those surfaces. And, and I think uh, I'll let Pam talk about how, if it's effective later on, but it, it got me, let's say that. Um, then let's move over to the um, Choctaw uh, Cultural Center in Durant, Oklahoma, which also is opening late spring. Now these look like, these are, hey, these are touch screens. They're just rectangles, right? But they're not just touch screens the way we're using them. They rotate and they're actually, they rotate on, is a live feed on this big di uh, diorama of a hickory forest. And they're really a window into the way the Choctaws related to and managed the forest. And big story, and, and you can explore that using these these monitors. Um, but you're you're actually getting a window into the culture of the Choctaws, into their worldview through these use of these monitors. Are just not simple touchscreens. It's a, it's actually more complex. Anybody have everybody on the panel at least understand that? I know we can't ask questions in this format, but I hope I'm being clear enough with that explanation. Um, also at the Choctaw Cultural Center, what you see here is a work in progress. Here's a three-dimensional model and a mural you can see on the wall. And originally working with the designer, he wanted to highlight different areas on the model. You've all seen these models with the little buttons and lights that go on, right? And as we dove into the content and realized the importance, this is called Moundville. This is uh, of the, um, the Choctaw's ancestral, kind of uh, uh, city in the Mississippi Valley uh, back around 1100 AD, 1150 AD. And so we took a look at this three-dimensional model and we said, let's project onto it and onto the mural 
to tell that story. And so what you see here is we may come alive. This is projection from, from overhead, as well as projection on the mural. And then, um, so we, we certainly make that model come alive and then we use it as our canvas to tell a story about Moundville and it's important to the Choctaw culture and mythology. So again, it's taking, these are not exotic technology. Oh, one other little sidebar thing. You see these interactives on the, on the left and there's ones on the right. When you, when you start to engage in those interactives when it's not show mode on the model, you actually can, can throw out projections onto the model of things that you're looking at in the interactive. So again, conventional technology, but we're trying to push it. We're trying to use it in a way you can't use it at home. You can't use it you know, in any other place but coming to this museum. Federal Reserve Bank in St. Louis. We take a pretty boring uh, but architecturally significant space on the left, which is, uh, dates back to 1927 when the bank was built. And we turn it into a, tr we transform it into a, a little intro experience to whet your appetite to learning about the economy. Um, so again, we're, we're through video mapping and sound, we, we kind of really so, kind of take, catch you off guard, let's just say, catch the visitor off guard. Again, common touch screens, um, but you're playing a game here, a trading pit game. It's competitive. Your goal is to see how much money you can make, how quickly you play it. It's a minute game. It's iterative. You, the more you play it, the more you catch on. And people sitting around can, can look at the big screen to see what's happening in the trading pit game. It's a, again, very popular. This one is at Sioux City. It's an electromechanical digital experience. So this young woman here is turning this big wheel and she, where she's going back in time. She can turn back time here in Sioux City, Iowa. You've all been to Sioux City, right? Everyone on this call? Everyone in this conference? You, you have, right? Yes, of course you have. Pam, I know you have, right? <laughs> um, the idea here is though, we, we, you know, we're breaking out of the rectangle, okay? We're breaking out of the aspect ratio of monitors and screens. We're, we're actually giving something, creating something tactile here that has a digital interface that you can see this uh, top gear here, if you can see my cursor, uh, tracks where you are in time. And so a lot of people can see what's going on there, although there's one player here. So again, non-conventional. We take conventional technologies, projection, um, computers, but we use them in a non-conventional way. Or we um, here at the Civil Rights Museum, these are touch screens, no, absolutely but they're touch screens themed and embedded into a space that is, this is about the march continuing. And th this particular um, interactive is a challenge. It, it, it helps you understand the challenges of integration back in the 60s. Um, and there's some hard questions here that, that uh, you, you'll have to ask. But again, it's, it's uh, more of a group experience and well, or two kids here playing it. <laughs> um, we go to one of my favorite examples when, when Vidette asked about favorite experiences. So Brown versus Board of Education, separate but equal. It's a legal decision by the Supreme Court. It could, be, could have been very boring to do a media piece about that. So again, working with the designer, hand in glove together, we decided we came up with this classroom, this split classroom right down the middle here. You see that line that goes, that crack that goes right up through the, uh, uh, the blackboard here. And one side represents poor rural black, one side represents poor rural white. And um, there's also sound and lights that, that, that kind of fill out this experience. And we project directly on the blackboard that you see here and uh, really engage, well, you can see these are relatively young kids. I, I, I would hope that they're as engaged as they look, let's just say. Um, and the last one I'm gonna show you here real quickly is um, at the Mashantucket Pequot Museum in uh, Connecticut. There's a story about a Mashantucket Pequot woman named Ma Matt Longevin. And if not for her staying on the property, the land, 
she was Mashantucket Pequot. If not for this cabin that she lived in on the land, um, if she hadn't stayed there and been stubborn about staying there, the tribe would have lost their rights to the land and they would have lost any kind of uh, recognition, federal recognition as a tribe. And so what we did is we recreated the interior of her cabin. Very, very true recreation. And through video projection directly onto the surface here and sound and lighting effects throughout, we make the space and the story come alive of just how important her stubbornness and her staying on that property meant to the uh, subject, you know, the future of the Mashantucket Pequot tribe. So those are all examples. There's many more. I won't, I won't bore you with any more, but the idea here is use conventional technology, but use it in a way that uh, in, in create spaces that help slow visitors down and allow them to engage um, in the material, in, in, the, in the experience. So we're not just sticking video up on a screen. We're not sticking a video up on a big monitor. We're not, there's nothing wrong with those technologies. In fact, some, you need a little bit of a mixture. Some of those require smaller screens and, and more conventional, but at least every museum should have what we consider to be a handful of signature experiences that really jump out and grab the visitors and slow them down and, and, and touch, touch the head and touch the heart at the same time. Um, the challenge here though is, okay, I've, we've just taken a look at a, a broad sampling of possible you know, uses of conventional technology. How do you um, design a whole museum's work of this? You know, how do you approach it when you think of an entire new museum or an entirely new gallery? And that's where we're going next. I'm not gonna answer that question. So let me stop sharing my screen for a second <laughs> and let you guys give it back to Vidette. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, I have to let everyone on, all of our members know that uh, before we uh, opened up the, the room, um, Steve started showing uh, images and I had a moment. I had a whole moment because uh, when he says that uh, media touches the heart and it touches the soul, it touches the head, the foot, whatever. Um, <laughs> I, I, it just made me realize how much I miss you all, how much I miss the work that we do in person. Um, and so I'm not like a sobbing child on the, the, uh, the call right now. Let's move on to the next question. Uh, so our next question is, uh, what can multimedia do in an exhibit, in, in an exi exhibition that graphics, physical interactives and artifacts alone cannot? Um, what are some of the desired outcomes for your visitor experience? And Steve, since you just spoke, I'm going to let your, your mouth kind of, yeah. Um, and I'm going to give the, uh, pass it off to Joy and then, um, Taffany, and then we'll circle back around to whomever, uh, wants to give Steve a break in Manatnock, or we'll come back to Steve. Thank you, Vidette. Um, so just to, to repeat the, um, the question, what can multimedia do in an exhibit that graphics, physical interactives, and artifacts alone cannot? I think um, one of the things, I'm, I work for Lord Cultural Resources, and we are a, a consulting firm that only works with arts and cultural assets. Um, and we, we, call, we call our institutions and our organizations assets because that's what we are assets to our communities, right? So I spoke about, when I talked about the most powerful media experiences that I have, I, I use the word connections. And I think that um, the, the, the power of multimedia, um, that the sound, the, the description and the definition that, um, that the, uh, the that you said it out loud, but Manad not provided is, um, exactly that because when you when you talked about um, the visceral reactions that you know that looking at those different images um, that first image gave you of ha being in a space a triple AM conference where we are all gathered together and we see someone we know and we ah you know we scream 
we have that sound connection that makes you feel something. We, um, when lights change, um, it, it makes you feel something, right? Um, words on a panel, sometimes an image can take you right there, but really and truly that, that, what, that show that, um, I was calling the show, that Steve just put up for us, the way that the images are coming at us in, in different spaces, it does elicit feelings and it does help us to see um, and, and really um, connect more with the stories. And we, it, it elicits a moment in our own particular lives. We may not be a part of the Pequot um, uh, tribal experience or indigenous experience, but we can connect that in our lives because the sound might remind us of, some, of something and the light might remind us of something. So I went into an emotional response to answer that question, but I think that's the power of media. It's, it's really all about those emotions. Thank you, Joy. Uh, Taffany. Yeah, I definitely agree with Joy, the sounds. Um, and along with that, there's also the way in which um, visitors engage, um, not only with staff of museums, but how um, they engage and become connected more to the history, uh, the true history. I know for us, one of the things, um, our museum, uh, we had exhibits, but a lot of them were just static. You know, they were plaques and a lot of the work fell on the staff, right? To tell the story. And then we're always concerning ourselves with narrative and, and, and ways in which we have to engage with different audiences. What I'm finding now, just whenever I get a draft treatment from a NADNOP, I always envision like this is leading, right? So they're leading and then visitors get to engage. Um, their response um, is more in, in um, is, is more to uh, the storytelling, I guess, if, if, you, if you have it. Um, and I also think, uh, what is going to be really powerful for us is, you know, we've heard from our staff, we've heard from external people, like, wow, there, there just seems like it could be more. Like people are always expecting more and we have a small space, right? So what we're getting is, uh, I think we're connecting all of those pieces and also just still being in alignment with what is at our core, which is the educational piece of it, right? Because we do see ourselves as an educational um, center and um, just connecting the past to the present um, and capturing what is unseen. And I think that that's been the most powerful thing for us. And Thank you. Um, so I'm, I don't think I need to circle back over to Steve for this particular um, question because you and Joy did such a great job just being so eloquent about uh, what it feels like in a space. But for the Manatnock team, um, there there have been tons of questions around what's what's happening with media um, and what where do you see media going in the times of COVID and how are you planning for that? I'll start with that one. Um, I think that everybody's thinking a lot about COVID. I think a lot of us are very hopeful that with the vaccination that we really won't have to worry so much in the future. I mean, I know so many museums are closed down or reduced hours and all that, but there are easy ways, for example, at the um, Southern Poverty Law Center Civil Rights Memorial, we're going to use styluses instead of touch, you know, touching your fingers on the touch screens. And there are a lot of those simple kinds of accommodations that we can make easily. Um, I know at the Truman Library where I've been working there, um, they're just gonna have a lot of wipes out there and a lot of things to clean surfaces initially. And over time, I think we're gonna to be able to figure that out. But most of all, and this is actually where we were gonna go in the conversation anyway, is this idea that it's all part of the master media planning which should be happening at the beginning or we feel should be happening at the beginning of a project so that we can put in whatever we need to put in to make sure that people feel safe, 
that it's viable, that it, it can last for years if need to, or it could be switched out if it doesn't need to. But I, I have to say, I don't see us like doing away entirely with touchscreen interactives. I just don't think that that's gonna happen immediately. We all know that there are sensors that can activate things and, and videos and stuff and perhaps fewer buttons. Um, but you know, that's, media isn't gonna solve the problem of, you know, um, you know, uh, our, <laughs> I want to say our spit in the air, you know what I mean? Social, social distancing. So, yeah, yeah, but, so, but, yeah there's always going to be the social distancing piece. As, but, as, Cla I, go ahead. No, no, as go Claudia said, I'm just going to repeat what Claudia said, really. We fold that if, if COVID planning continues to be, uh, or COVID continues to be an issue, we fold that into the master media planning in working with the exhibit designer of how to come, of coming up with strategies, some of which Claudia just mentioned, um, to, to make people feel comfortable and, and safe in the environment. It, it's, it just, it is, be, it, I don't want to belittle it by any means, it just, it does become part of that master planning process. Right, and so then we wanted to get into now, I think the whole idea of master media planning and, and what that means, Steve, if you want to start that and we can all sort of chip, you know, jump in. Yeah, it, it really, it's simple, it means, as we, as we think and invest in the content and do our research and our homework on a particular, um, for a particular museum, working in concert with the exhibit designer, we start to take a holistic look at the visitor experience through the lens of media. So to make sure that there's a lot of different media textures, okay? A touchscreen is a touchscreen. No matter how much your content is different throughout the museum, Every time you come to a touch screen, that's it. That's the media form. It's good. There can be good programs on it and they're gonna be, they're part of our museum textures. But what you wanna do in a master plan is make sure you've, you've got these multiple textures. Um, think about, so that the visitor doesn't start to become numb or you know, how the, you know how the glaze goes over your eyes after a while at a museum? Happens to all of us. Well, our challenge from a media point of view is wake you up once in a while as you go through that museum. Pace your experience by figuring out how to embed media experience in the museum at the right places, at the right times, so we keep you awake until you're done. And then you can go to sleep. And I'll just add to that. I mean, at the begin <laughs> at the beginning of the process, you know, all media firms, Manana included, we do a ton of research into the content. We figure out what those stories are, what's best told through media, so that as we go through an, um, the museum and start to work with the designer and the museum team, we look at each gallery space and figure out how that story progresses. What's told in artifacts? What's taught? told in graphic panels, where are we going to put a theater? Where are we going to do an interactive? Because now it's time people need to be moving, they need to be thinking, they need to be engaged in a different kind of way. So those are the different textures and we think about that early on and that's where you start to see a really integrated museum when things are thought out at the very beginning and you don't wait, you know, we don't have the designer and the museum team just say, okay, well maybe put a video there and maybe put a video there. And, and, and people used to do that years back and they're doing it less now. Now we're thinking in advance, how do we pace the experience to keep people engaged? How do we make sure that we don't, you know, put them to sleep by having too many theaters in a row, you know, and that, it, that, that there's a pacing to that experience. And I just Thank say, you. No, go ahead. I was just going to add to that to bring up, um, you know, what Joy and Tapney were talking about with the emotional content, you know, that very early on, we can find the voices, you know, that, that have that emotional contact and figure out who are the people that need to speak in this part of the museum and in that part of the museum and, and who can tell the, the, the emotional stories, you know, that we want to tell through media rather than trying to say, you know, oh, we'll just you know, we need a history of X, Y, Z. So we'll put a little theater over there and, you know, we'll have a narrator. You know, one of the things we really like to do is interview a lot of people and have authentic voices telling the story rather than having an overarching narrator tell the story. And, you know, this, but identifying those stories and those people have to happen really early on. It's hard to do that, you know, if you're trying to play catch up by just, you know, coming in too late in the process. 
a good example of what of what Tracy is talking about is in the when we were early on working on the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum, we went out with the team from the state and the designer to these small communities to talk about this. And we heard firsthand from these from a lot of folks who were kind of very doubtful. Are you 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 kidding me? The state's going to do a civil rights museum. You're right. But we heard from them. We heard directly what their concerns, their fears, and their hopes were. And I can only tell you, it's not something that somebody could have, they couldn't have had the same impact on us, the folks who were a part of that team, if we had just heard it secondhand. The same thing with when we did, we're working with the Choctaw Nation. We sat down around the table with, with the nation and the, 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 uh, the, the cultural committee, and we heard from them what was important. And, and we learned from them what their worldview was, is, which is different from our worldview. And again, I don't, we could not have learned that from a, reading books, no matter how many books. It was just something you had to be there with. I'll, I'll give you one quick example. The, the head of the, this, uh, Dr. Ian Thompson, who's, who's Choctaw and also an anthropologist, um, he looked at the architect's first rendering of the, of the in, in, um, kind of lobby space and he said to the architect, well, that's all very nice, but it has absolutely nothing to do with Choctaw culture or worldview. And you, I, again, you can't, we, I can't, maybe other people can, I can't get that second hand. We can't get that second hand. That's why the kind of co-evolution, the, the, the kind of media design and exhibit design informing each other is so important at the ground level. Yes, those, uh, those stakeholders meetings are absolutely imperative when planning any uh, exhibit. And I'm so thankful to hear that that's what Manat Knock does anyway, uh, in, 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 uh, in partnership with the museum. Um, I have to jump around a little bit because I'm keep trying to keep an eye on the time. Um, and I don't have a problem with going over, but I know that some of the panelists have uh, time commitments. So um, I'm not gonna try to hold you hostage, although I would love to. Um, one, <laughs> one of the, uh, one of the things that we wanted to address is the role of the museum team during production. Um, and Pam, uh, can you just quickly give us uh, a little bit of uh, what, what you have uh, had um, in Gallery 8 with uh, This Little Light of Mine and Manat Knox? That is one of my favorite, favorite things um, at, at your museum. I mean, the whole museum is impeccable but that that piece alone um is one of my favorites so if you could just give us uh, just a few words about it and how you were able to uh collaborate with manette knock on that well that's gallery three i'm sorry that's gallery three that's oh three. sorry yeah. i have my number <laughs> that's okay that's the it's center in the gallery. gallery. Yeah. It's in the gallery in your museum. <laughs> that's center gallery. As you come out of gallery two, you know, I tell people you need to be able to, it's like coming out of a war. So you need to breathe. You need to be able to, to get your energy back. Uh, you need to be able to relax, release, relate, as I tell folks. But going into gallery three and all these colors and these people are looking at you. These are soldiers who are part of the civil rights movement. And, and you're just taking that in, but all these colors are entangled together. And, 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 and the premise is that all these people that came into Mississippi, black, white, of all ethnicities, and they came together for one goal. And that was to, to, to break Mississippi, to shape Mississippi, because it was ground zero of the civil rights uh, movement. So with that being said, people love to go in, children love to go in. They like to get in the circles and the music. You know, the first time I heard this little light of mine coming from uh, the, the, the sculpture, I got chills. I really uh, had chills and I still sometimes cry. That's my song that when I go out to speak to people, I make them understand because you get inspired understanding that you are a light and that that light is able to go out into the, the communities and, and do whatever passion you have. So people are inspired by that. Again, people cry, people take it all in, and then they say, okay, we're going back into the Civil Rights Museum. So that's what it is. And, and, and we, we are now having to 
change out the seating because in the last four years we've been sitting in a, the, the chairs are, are tearing up because people sit there. So, so it's an important spot uh, for us. And, and we thank Monadnock and Transform It for the work that they did to, to bring about this amazing piece, this sculpture that is, that is everywhere in on everybody's photographs throughout the, the United States and the world. Well, yeah, yeah if, I I, could put, if I could put a similar chandelier in my house, I would. It's absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. I'm sorry, go ahead, Tracy. I, I was just gonna add to what Pam was saying. You know, one of the things that we get asked a lot is, you know, how can we inspire our visitors? How can we get people to want to take action? And I think, you know, the way Pam was just describing that, it doesn't have to be in an obvious way. You know, there's nothing in that sculpture that's telling you what to do, but you just feel it, you know, and it's the whole environment and the whole experience. And, you know, I think that it's, it's just really helpful to, to think, you know, how, how can we do things more symbolically, you know, because that's really what that space is all about. And I believe it was Tiffany earlier who talked a lot about music. Music is crucial. You know, music, it inspires people. And those songs in particular that are in the sculpture are very inspiring. And, and they, the that they were also sung by people throughout Mississippi, young and old. It was very, very cool. And it drove the movement. And so, you know, you went into the church house to hear the music and that gave you the strength and the faith and no fear to go out and, and start again. So truly, yes. Tiffany? Stephanie, do you want to speak about uh, how you're working with the community in Manatnock on your project? Yeah, only, uh, yeah, I was going to say that was a, a challenge for us because of where our timeline was. And, and what I want to say to those who are, are on the call, if you haven't or if you don't plan to engage the community and have those stakeholder meetings, I, I would certainly encourage it. Um, you know, and even even pulling on the membership and, and connecting with the membership to inquire and ask questions about the processes and, um, you know, their thoughts on, on some of the things that you're thinking. Because, um, you know, if you do this work in silo, I, I oftentimes tell my staff, that's how the narrative shifted about the movement in the first place, right? Or wherever, you know, it is. And, um, I went through the Southeastern Museum uh, Conference, their Leadership Institute, and that's one of the things that we oftentimes, you know, we talked about. It's just that we're all doing great work and we're trying and we're trying to move forward within our own perspective communities, but we don't communicate enough with each other. Um, and so I think the stakeholder meetings are important. We did a lot of deep dive with our internal staff. And that's just because our staff part of orientation and onboarding is to bring people through the Civil Rights um, Memorial Center. And we also polled some of our donors, but it, I, it, you know, we have to remember that we're part of our community. And that's one of the things that I felt for sure when I went to Miss Mississippi, I feel it when I'm in Atlanta and when I'm at Memphis. So I just wanna just stress that that is a crucial point, um, but and I know we're running on time, but one of the things that I will say about working with Manette Knopf is that they did listen to what our overarching goal was and they understood how important it was for us to be in alignment with our overall mission when it comes to education um, and being a catalyst for racial justice specifically in the Deep South and how that tied to the Civil Rights Memorial Center. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, Joy, do you have anything that you want to add? I just did want to add to what Taffany was saying because I just had a conversation yesterday. We we're talking about the process and bringing uh, media to the table, bringing community to the table at in, in day one. It's the difference between saying, here is what we have, please come, and what do you want? What do you need? What is the story you want to tell? And that makes all the difference. Yes, I'm inviting you into my house when I say, please come. But if I ask you what you want, we're building the house together. And I think that's what we're talking about with this rethinking media. 
let's let's kind of build this house together. You're absolutely right, Joy. I, I sometimes share um, a story about a gentleman who called um, Triple AM maybe sometime last year, and his he was kind of frustrated that they had a museum, but nobody was visiting. And he said, the community is not coming out. We're in a community. How come the community is not coming out? And I'm like, well, are you, did you do some stakeholders meetings to figure out what, you know, are the, does the community see themselves in you? Are you working with a design team? Are you working with a, a team like, well, I didn't want to, I usually always put you guys on blast with Lord Cultural Resources, but I didn't, I didn't do that that time because, you know, I'm trying to figure out uh, what, what he wanted. And, you know, when we got off the phone, he was kind of like, oh, so there's media that we can put into the museum. And there are stories from the community that, you know, I can also incorporate into the museum. And I'm like, you got it. Um, and that's the thing that's different with our museums uh, for, for AAAM. Um, we're part of the community. So we start at the community level and then start branching out. Um, and I think that that's one of the reasons why, you know, we're always, uh, you know, uh, we always have touch points. Even, even with, uh, you know, as you do your, um, your traveling exhibits, you'll see that your community wants to be a part of that and wants to be able to say, um, hey, I have some, I have some things. Well, you're always going to get people who say, I have some ideas for your community exhibit as you're changing this out. And, you know, it's important to listen to those. Uh, we are almost that time. Does anybody from the Manatnock team have any other projects that you want to share or um, any uh, uh, testimonies that you have about the visitor's reaction to what you have going on? See? Um, am I on mute here? Uh, no, I'm not on mute. Um, I, guess, I guess really I would end by just kind of reflecting on the main points, and that is the importance of multimedia design, the dialogue between multimedia design and exhibit design. One doesn't come first before the other is, is in our world. They, um, another is as you think about designing your museum and working with um, people, uh, make just make an effort to, to keep thinking, break out of the rectangle, break out of the rectangle. What's an experience that I can give, we can give your visitors that they can't get anywhere else? And think in textures, if you will. And then the last part, and the reason we're doing that is to answer the question, um, how do we slow visitors down and give them opportunities to pay attention so they can feel something and know, learn something? And I hate to use the word learn, but experience something, okay? And feel something. Um, and that, that, that's my closing. That's all the best I can put it. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Uh, Claudia or Tracy, do you guys have any parting words? Hmm. Oh, you guys are letting Steve do all the talking? Yeah, come on, well, come on, you guys. Wanted, you wanted some <laughs> testimonial. And, and so, I mean, I'll, I'll just say we were, we were recently out installing for the Choctaw Cultural Center. And, um, you know, there were two things that we heard repeatedly. And one was, I really enjoy hearing the voices of the community because we made a big effort to do a lot of interviews and have a lot of different voices and all the programs and all the programs are narrated by Choctaw tribal members. And, it, and you know, that was, was really appreciated and a lot of fun to do. And, and the other one was, I've never seen that before. Um, you know, all these, the, the Moundville and, and we have um, a series of programs and little niches of caves of creation stories where sculptures are illuminated by projections. And you know, just all sorts of things like that, that you just, that are unique to this space that you can't get anywhere else. And, and that was really appreciated as well. Yeah, I, Sue Folsom, the head of the cultural committee after we walked through the exhibits and she saw all the media or just the saw media, she said, you know, before we started planning our cultural center, we visited 35 museums. We've never seen anything like what you guys have done here. And that was, that just felt, okay, we're on the right track. And that's what every museum should be. Everybody has the right to, or should be trying to make their museums unique and different and very special and very 
representative of your community or your overarching goals and themes. And um, any good media firm will work really hand in hand with you to, to really reach those goals and make it a really cool and different experience because we have the technology and the means to do that now. And all it takes is a little bit of inspiration and creativity and working. And it's not just us, by the way, it's the team. It's everybody. We're holding hands through all this. We're together we're thinking it through and that's what makes it so brilliant in the end and that's why there's so many successful wonderful museums out there and the ones that aren't you can imagine are probably ones that didn't have that kind of collaborative spirit thank you claudia um i can just let you guys know as members that i thoroughly trust manatnock and i thoroughly trust joy um, and the one thing, although I don't have a museum space, I can tell you that I had dinner, well, lunch uh, with Alan and Claudia and Steve, and we were just, it was a straight up vibe. All we were doing was just talking about museums and, and how uh, we wanted to change the world through the work that, that they were doing. And I was just like, I feel like you, you guys have something that's so special. Um, and you, you really, the fact that they listen is great. I mean, folks, folks sometimes are just like, no, I know best. It doesn't matter. But they listen um, and, um, and they continue to listen. And I want to just thank you guys for your time, um, not just your time today, but your, your time in the field um, and listening uh, and, and just making sure that you implement those things, all those little things that Steve spoke about earlier about uh, having stakeholders meetings and listen, speak, speaking to the community and implementing those things throughout the museums. I feel like uh, you guys have the secret sauce um, and I don't, I don't eat McDonald's, so I can't say it's like the secret <laughs> sauce for the Big Mac or anything like that. But um, I, I feel like you guys have a, a very special thing. And Joy, thank you so much for your time. Um, Pam and Taffany, thank you for just always, always, always being available whenever Triple AM calls on you. Um, Pam, if you could try to work on something so I can get the chandelier for like a miniature chandelier of this little light of mine into my house, I would greatly appreciate you. I need all of those, those positive vibes throughout the house whenever, you know, the seven-year-old is going crazy. Alan, I know that you were just um, a, a fly on the wall today, but please go ahead and say a quick hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, I just feel we Alan. had enough people to tell the story here, so I'm, <laughs> I'm holding back. But let me yes, just say, Alan, okay, Alan I'm sorry, just let me can I just say one thing, sorry for that. I just, uh, there've been some questions on the chat. So I put down Alan's and Steve's email addresses, our website, our phone number, if anything wasn't answered or addressed in this, this forum, please feel free to get in touch with us directly. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hugs to you, Vidette. Absolutely. Oh, no problem. <laughs> I'd like to guys. say hello. Thank you so much. Can I say hello? Yeah. Hey, Bob. Absolutely. Can you Hi, hear Bob. Me? How are you? I'm, never, I'm still not good on Zoom, but I've been in radio for 24 years, so go figure. Um, but th <laughs> this has been, it was funny, I thought I was going to learn about <clears throat> how to recruit somebody to work on our Facebook page. <laughs> uh, that shows you how I missed the target, but this is this is right on time for us. And I, I want to applaud the people who, who were talking about uh, uh, primary source, because while there are stories to tell, there are also people who are interested in creating legacy for themselves that never really took place. And and that's really a, a big focus of the Birmingham Black Radio Museum to reach lots and lots of people to recreate um, a story and in the case in, the, in our case radio's role in the Birmingham uh, movement and so uh, there's a little piece on my Facebook page um, which has tall Paul picture in it and some of you may know Paul uh, who were involved in the movement but uh, I would say look at it as, as a short subject uh, it's a little video, but you can tell that we're grappling with telling the truth about something very si significant that happened in Birmingham. And again, it's just great to be on this conversation with y'all. Bob, I, th I thank you so much for your comments. I, I, 
I light up whenever anybody emails us, but uh, the fact that whenever I see your name, I'm like, there's my, there's my guy, Bob, because, uh, you know, when I was first hired and we were in Jackson with uh, Pam, Pam's going to get tired of me talking about Jackson, but um, we were <laughs> in Jackson with Pam, you were one of the first people that ran up and congratulated me. Um, so I just really thank you. And I thank you for the work that you've done um, at your museum. Um, I feel like everybody on this call who is a member, um, I feel like we owe you a, a debt of gratitude and you're part of the AAAM family for a reason. And I'm so thankful for each and every one of you. Um, I do, I, I know that we are so over time at this point, but if you guys have any questions, please, if there's something that we did not address, please feel free to email us at info at Black Museums, and I will make sure that the team gets it so that they can respond to you directly. Um, we are going to be working with um, Pam and um, her museum about uh, raising funds for water uh, because Jackson is, they just don't have water right now that um, we think is sustainable for um, the folks in Jackson. So that's one other thing. And then also our call for proposals um, those will be closing on March 13th. So, Bob, I look forward to your proposal. I know it's going to be in there. Um, Sam, I think that I'm sure I'll see something from you as well, as well as Rico and everyone else. Bessie, please make sure that you put in your, uh, your uh, call for proposal. And George, I know that you have one coming in as well. So I'm going to just say everybody's name. So everybody who's on here, all 39 of you who who are just still sticking around with us, please make sure that you submit those calls for proposals for this year. And I thank you. Um, thank you, Manat Knock, for your time. Thank you, Joy, Taffany, and uh, Pam. Pam, please don't think that you're my favorite uh, because I don't want anybody else to think that as well. But I, I love you guys, and I'll speak to you soon. Have a great day. Great. Thank you so much, and everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much.